Hello everyone, this is Rajeshi Sangupta and we are here in the third installment of our week on fashion in the post-independence India. So this, uh, in this installment, we'll be talking about indigenous textiles and designers' interventions. So as you already know that, I mean, in the last um, installment, we have already started talking about people like Ridhan Mujumdar and so on, who have not only just written Mujumdar, but then there are also other people, the designers who would come up in 1950s and with their education either in India or abroad and then try to redefine certain aspects of textile making and craft making in the Indian subcontinent, especially in India. And and uh, we, we know that, I mean, how, how those were instrumental in terms of understanding how the later designers also made conscious um, attempt to sort of redefine certain kind of indigenous textiles which have been existing in the Indian subcontinent and in India for the longest period of time. So today our discussion will start with designer Nelly Setna. So Nelly Setna was someone who we find that in the 1950s uh, she went to London and then studied there and then of course we find that I mean during her stay in the UK she also not only just studied her interest but also sort of documented a large group of blocks and textiles from uh, the Victorian Albert Museum collection. So as I have mentioned earlier that I mean how the Victorian Albert Museum came into being that is the South Kensington Museum that was established 1857 and then later on how um, it was sort of like I mean consolidated into this art and craft museum in the uh, early 20th century and eventually became this Victoria and Albert Museum and so uh, if this is the history of this museum we know that I mean this is a museum which holds a lot of um, artifacts and and then design samples and everything else from the colonial period which were collected during this uh, the great exhibition in 18 and the later ones. For that reason, when Nelly Setna goes back to this museum collection, she knows that this is the this is the this is the museum collection which will hold a large group of um, this this samples and which which might help the designers uh, or, and the artisans in the uh, post-independence India to kind of like reclaim certain parts of their cultural legacy. And that is the reason what we find that Nelly Setna had minutely documented a number of those textile samples, the, the designs on the blocks and everything else and a lot of those designs were definitely not in practice anymore in the artisanal sectors in India and when Nelly Setna documented all of them, she brought them back to uh, India when, when she travelled back and then she not only just sort of documented them and made them available for the scholar community or like the communities of the textile connoisseurs but then she also published books with like all those detailed drawings so that those can be made available to the artisans and she shared this knowledge with the artisans, the blockmaker communities mostly in Andhra Pradesh, that time Andhra Pradesh and of course like I mean today uh, how the Andhra Pradesh has been bifurcated. So this is something we find that she was someone who did this archival work and then she also had her own interest in weaving and then she thought of disseminating the knowledge that she had gained from studying the archives in London which was definitely not something made possible in the which was definitely not made possible in the seasonal sectors in India. So for that reason what we find that what we find during this time that for those aspects what we see that Nelly Setna was someone who uh, sort of made this kind of overlappings between research, the designer's intervention and how that can go back to the communities for um, um, uh, betterment in their livelihood and so on. So this, this kind of like this new role of the designer that we find who were not just designing for their own brand or not designing for their own benefit but was already sort of invested in terms of 
to the betterment of the of the livelihood of the crafts people in the Indian subcontinent. So this this is this is one of the examples that we find that how the designers when I say that the designers interventions I do not mean that this is just about redefining textiles in terms of that how the textiles were used and then how the textiles gained its meaning and then how those were sort of like redefined in according to uh, the designers taste and choice and preference which are all connected to this idea of fashion but then I am also sort of connecting this idea to how the designers responsibility was something that made a huge intervention in terms of uh, how the craft sectors managed to sustain and um, at a time when there were different kind of like motivations for people to sort of uh, um, pursue. So for example, like the, the drive towards technology is something we can understand that that was certainly driving more and more people and especially the, uh, uh, the people who were aspiring to work in the urban sectors would certainly not be interested in the uh, craft sectors and so a large group of people from the villages if they aspire to uh, become workers in the urban sectors and that is the time we also see that perhaps um, um, a lot of people who were uh, um, sort of um, involved in the in the um, in the uh, artisanal sectors or agricultural sectors in villages would try to move to the urban centers for in search of better livelihood. So instead of sort of feeding to this idea, we find that there were certain kind of um, um, attempts by, by Nelly Setna and many other designers um, who were um, invested in this social cause. And of course, people like Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay and Pupul Jaikar who would try to bring the artisans back to their um, um, to their their community uh, practices so that these practices can continue and then the artisans can also thrive so this is the kind of like i mean background in which we find that not only nelly setna but a number of other people they also came forward and then they also contributed immensely to this sector of craft making in india now Apart from those issues, we find that Nelly Setna's work, I mean her training as a designer and then her interest in weaving and then of course like I mean her studies of different kind of textiles. So when she studies textiles from the museum collection, it's not just she is sticking to just the ones which are there from 19th century or 18th century, but she was equally aware of the different kind of interventions that took place in the 20th century. And for that reason, we find that she moved effortlessly between um, the kind of like, I mean, the, the scheme or like the requirement in a traditional practice and then like, I mean, what an individual designer can do in their own practice. So an example of that we can see in the left side of the screen and here we find there is this untitled hanging this is a cotton and wool tapestry that is there on screen and in which we see that I mean there is this shape which is like I mean this semicircular shape which is hanging and then from the middle of it there is this um, rose of this yarn that is hanging it's almost making it feel like I mean some kind of ritualistic object but then we do not really know that I mean if this is something that has a fixed meaning or Nelly Setna wanted to make use of it to, to convey something else. To me, it seems that I mean there is a conscious effort in terms of using certain kind of material which have been long used in the, uh, um, in the history, not only in the Indian subcontinent but also part of Middle East and in Europe and so on, this tapestry technique and in which we see that uh, how this, this material which was used and then the technique of making tapestry is something that is again incorporated. But then the object that comes out as a result of it in which we see that there is woven yarn which is there to make the tapestry and then there is a yarn that is not really woven but then like I mean this is hang here just as fiber. So this kind of this column like this column of fiber that we find here is something it's a reminder of the materiality that goes into the making. So it's again it's a reminder of like what all different kind of material that goes into making this kind of tapestry and a lot of times since we stress on the 
final product that comes out of a weaving technique or any kind of technique, we tend to forget that what kind of materials or what kind of techniques might have been used in, in making certain kind of objects. So when we see there is a conscious overlapping of woven yarn and then just fiber, then we try to understand that I mean what is the relationship between them. If the fiber is something that is the primary stage of making this yarn or it is something that I mean after the yarn that has been woven into this fabric and if it is torn and if, if it gets dilapidated then all that remains is those fibers. So it can be something to do with like I mean this making but we do not we cannot really have a conclusive idea that this is exactly what it means and this is something we also find that how this sensi sensibility towards like I mean making things which are not really clearly defined and something we can see that how in the field of textile making which was considered as strictly utilitarian this kind of interventions by the designers that could push the perimeters of understanding textiles. So this is not something we can understand as utilitarian but this is something it is in between utilitarian and non-utilitarian items such as paintings or other objects that we appreciate in the field of fine arts. I'm not saying that this kind of experiments are new in terms of of course like I mean in terms of like I mean how the material is used or like so the crossover between utility and non-utility as we see that is explored in this um, in this in this textile is something that we can understand that had its root perhaps in the Bauhaus experiments and some of the other experiments that we have seen in Western Europe and in USA in the early 20th century. So Nelly Setna is someone who had minutely studied some of those developments in Western Europe and in the North Atlantic world but at the same time stayed close to the ground reality in India and that is how we find that her sensitivity towards material, towards making and at the same time her engagement to the, um, uh, her engagement with the artisanal communities in India, all those things made her position unique. We also find that the knowledge that she acquired from weaving and perhaps from tapestry weaving and also in terms of using weft threads and the extra weft threads in weaving is something that is also reflected in the other work she had done. So this, the, in the right side of the screen we have a mural from the Empress Towers lobby in Bombay and that was made in the early 1970s. In this we find that it's a ceramic mural in which like ceramic tiles, the small small tiles are sort of arranged in a particular way to make this entire this pattern and the, it's strictly geometric pattern that we find but in this one we find that the kind of color that is used and then the balance between the color the compositional format and everything else they have a lot to do with the way in which we understand weaving so in a way that the, the kind of themes that we address in this course for example, the crossover between textile making and architecture is something that is again um, uh, seen in Nelly Setna's intervention uh, here because how her knowledge in textile making then gets translated into making this mosaic mural in the Empress Towers lobby in Bombay. So we also find that during this time Nelly Setna had already she was uh, she, her, her lower portion of the body was paralyzed and with those uh, difficulties she never really stopped working and and continued to work in her uh, for, for her individual practice as well as to empower the artisanal communities in uh, India and this is a display shot from this exhibition that is titled the unpaved crusty earthy road and that was an exhibition of Nelly Setna's woven works and that we find and also like I mean some of the things that she had collected and that exhibition that took place in the Chatterjee and Lal gallery in Bombay or in Mumbai into 2021 and in this exhibition again we see that what kind of these tapestries or like I mean the woven textiles that she had made and a lot of those textiles we find them to be made perhaps as hanging and very consciously those hangings are made as a way in which we can understand them to be connected to the utilitarian textiles. So for example carpets, rugs and other textile which are used in home furnishing but then the way like the asymmetry works out in them and perhaps like I mean how the this, this overlapping between 
fiber and uh, woven yarn those those play out in these textiles so we cannot really sort of categorize them either as utilitarian or non-utilitarian items but they are kind of in between and that is something we also find that the the designers or the textiles uh, the textile artist when they work with textile we find that this kind of this duality that is somewhere in between like utility and non-utility is practiced and sort of emphasized in in this kind of works so of course that Nelly Setna's sensitivity towards textile has also enabled her to respond to this kind of ideas and successfully execute them in the work she had Con uh, completed. Now the other kind of like I mean practices we also find that after Nelly Setna I mean during not really after Nelly Setna but her contemporaries some of her contemporaries also uh, took measures and they have attempted to sort of work with the uh, artisanal communities in a much more respectful way so that not only just the designers but the artisans also get benefited from this kind of collaborations and them would be uh, Archana Shah and she was a graduate from uh, National Institute of Design. So National Institute of Design is another institute that we see the to have sort of like I mean came into existence after India's independence in the late 1950s in the early 1960s during this time. So during this time we find that the India government had taken measures in terms of establishing a number of institutes for example, the IITs, the Indian Institute of Technologies, those will come up in the late 1950s to early 1960s in um, several locations in India. And then there was also National Institute of Design. And of course, we also find that, I mean, IIM and so on, those management institutes would also come up. But then for National Institute of Design, there we find that there was a conscious attempt that was made for producing things and objects which would benefit the people in living in India, both in the urban and the rural sectors. And then there was also a conscious effort for the designers to be aware of the rich cultural heritage and at the same time the craft traditions in India so that how the artisans and designers can come forward and they can work together for certain kind of product making. So we find that some of the graduates from National Institute of Design during this time and of course in the later times as well that how they have sort of pushed this boundary of how to sort of work with artisans and then again this idea of how to treat people respectfully how to work with the artisans not as someone who was subordinate to the designer but someone who is collaborating with these designers for making objects or like I mean textiles and and this is an issue which we still find that to be uh, um, really problematic because um, this fine line between how we understand respect how we uh, treat people with respect but also sort of as work colleagues is something that that we uh, fail to understand in many different ways and that causes a lot of problem in terms of uh, this, this, this kind of collaborations. So some of the people who have successfully collaborated with the artisans been respectful to them and not only just worked with them but also did extensive documentation for betterment of their livelihood and also making people aware of this kind of practices are some of those who we are discussing as part of this uh, module or the week. So Archana Shah is someone we find that she after she graduated from National Institute of Design and she traveled extensively and she worked with the artisans uh, primarily in Gujarat but then she extended her field work to other parts of the country as well. And in 1981 she came up with her designer level that is bandage and of course that bandage that also means like this particular bandhni technique in which like I mean uh, this this resist dye technique in which the threads uh, are used for sort of tying small small knots in the uh, fabric and then it is dip dyed and then that is how we find 
find that the area which was wrapped with the thread has remained undyed and that is how those those patterns are created so this is something that is called bandhni and in which like tying or bandhna remains at the center of it archana shah's designer label bandage is something we find that that was per, perhaps like one of a kind when it was established in in 1981 as as a designer level in which we find the designer was uh, working with um, artisans as 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 collaborators and some of the ways in which we see that how her extensive documentation and then this this prolonged conversation and an association with the artisans that have figured into the making of this textiles and what gives the unique sort of identity to this textiles is perhaps that how redefining of this textile that took place and one of the example will perhaps be in the image that we have in the left side of the screen in which we find this tunic that it's a woman's tunic and in made in silk in which we see how the bandhni patterns are used and perhaps like i mean we can see that i mean how this patterns are there in the body and how these patterns are differently sort of oriented in the sleeves and then what we see that i mean in the bandhni textiles those are mostly used in like the untailored pieces of fabric so something we see in terms of like the ornni or like i mean the shoulder cloth and and perhaps perhaps also in the in the um, skirt and things like that but then when we think about making them into uh, tunics or like i mean when we have like i mean this untailored fabric and it needs to be made into a tunic then different kind of arrangements me, need to be made and for the designer it becomes crucial to understand that what kind of pattern will go where or like what kind of the flow of pattern might be uh, useful for particular areas in the body and that is how like i mean how the sleeves in this particular uh, uh, in this particular textile we find that to be different from um, the, the the arrangement of the of the bandhni patterns are different from uh, um, the arrangement of these patterns in the body so this kind of calculations and also like these decisions need to be made prior to the making of these textiles and then like the production also sort of continues or responds to this design decisions so that is how we find that how the designers experience exposure and then how it comes to contact with like the artisanal understanding of making this fabrics all of them they sort of come into play in textiles like this so these are some of the ways in which we can understand that how the designers interventions were crucial in terms of redefining this textiles and also sort of like i mean using certain indigenous techniques and making them available to the audience who were perhaps like i mean mostly living in the urban sectors this is also something we find that it also reflects that archana shah's idea about how we can sort of like i mean take craft forms to the future and it is about that i mean there needs to be an understanding about what the contemporary society wants and how to make use of particular kind of traditional techniques or the techniques which have been uh, practiced by artisans for generations and how to make a bridge between them and this is something that archana shah has sort of practiced over and over and that is how we find that i mean she had not abandoned any of this techniques that she started studying from 1970s but then always with each and every intervention she had tried to redefine these practices and she is not just the only designer who would be doing this but then this is one example among many in which we find that how the traditional textiles the textiles which are been practiced generationally by artisans are also sort of are, are are always sort of like i mean given new context and meaning with this new uh, interventions and with each and every of these new interventions if there is a successful collaboration between the uh, artisans and the designers then new meaning refreshing new take on understanding tradition is always introduced
Now the other example in this case would be looking at the Ajrak textiles and in Ajrak textiles what we find that of course that this highly laborious printing technique in which like resist printing and block printing both are utilized and this is a printing technique on cotton fabric that we find that is practiced in the Sindh region and the Sindh region I mean now that is in the nation state of Pakistan and then also like I mean part of Burmer and in Rajasthan and then also very much in the Kutch region of India in Gujarat. So uh, what we see that I mean this this Ajrak textiles which are again uh, as I have mentioned that they are minutely like laboriously created and a lot of those textiles originally were made for the Maldhari communities uh, like I mean the animal herders and the other people like I mean who side in this region and we see that the Ajrak textiles were also made as this untailored pieces of fabric in which these patterns are there but then these fabrics were used as either shoulder cloth or head covering or turban by, by this Maldhari community as we see in the in the left side of the image and Elinette Edwards, textile historian uh, and textile scholar has extensively worked on this transition between how Ajrak was then utilized by a number of designers to make them into wearable clothes and this Ajrak printed textiles. And so from this caste dress, how it sort of transitioned into this new kind of textile which was then used sort of displayed on ramp as we see in the right side of the screen and this is by Anita Rora for the brand Pero and in which we see how this Ajrak textiles that is there again in this tunic that the model is wearing and that is paired with jackets and scarves which would have like I mean perhaps not really made in the same locality but then like I mean with the color balance and everything how they are sort of mixed and matched and to kind of like respond to each other and by that it gives a new meaning. So with this kind of interventions we find that certain aesthetics and certain like I mean techniques of production and th their uh, engagement with the communities of block printer and, and, and sort of dyers are kept intact by these conscious designers but then also certain ideas were changed with this uh, kind of interventions. So for example the Maldari communities or the people in Sindh they still consider that the Ajrak shoulder cloth or the turbans should be worn in the upper part of the body whereas in this new interventions we see that Ajrak printed sari or skirt and all those things they go beyond the waistline. This is something we find that I mean this kind of changes they also simultaneously take place with these interventions. We will continue on this discussion more in the next lecture. Thank you.